Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Francisco Servent here with Keystone Law Firm, and we are going to be getting started here in just a minute. If you are having any trouble with audio, if for some reason your kind of internet connection starts to sound a little uh, glitchy or trouble, you are welcome to call that number on the screen. It's a, it is long distance, but you know, from your cell phone usually shouldn't be a problem. And then you enter that access code and that should just give you good clean audio from, uh, from your phone. And you can watch, you can of course watch the video on the screen still and get the slides. Um, so go ahead and make sure your uh, volume's turned up, you're comfortable, you got a, something to sip on and drink while we go through this. We'll be here for about 45 minutes to cover today's topic, which is when do married couples get forced into probate? And yeah, it does happen. So we'll get started here in just a minute, everyone. Well, good afternoon, everyone. So let's get started. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, married couples because that's the topic of today and that we get questions about this stuff a lot. Um, I'm going to show you guys how to protect your wife, your husband from getting dragged through a just a nightmare mess in court really no matter what your background is. <clears throat> um, if you've ever thought that the government and lawyers were out to get you, well, um, you're probably going to see that you're right in a lot of ways. Um, the, 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 they don't benefit from us succeeding and from us protecting our, 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 our families. The truth is that the court system and lawyers out there, they don't, they don't succeed when we protected our families. Um, they benefit when you end up with problems. So the difference is what I'm going to show you guys today is, is the information you use to actually protect your spouses, your husband, your wife. Um, sorry, I've got a little tickle in my throat, so I'm going to suck on some hard candy and make sure that, that your family is protected from this. So here's, so that's what we're here to do. Um, you know, I, I talk to clients and people a lot, and I know you guys, like, like myself, you dream about doing the right thing for your family, about making sure they're protected for, for the long haul. And the stuff that's going on right now with all this coronavirus, you know, it brings a lot of these thoughts to the top of our mind. It feels kind of scary sometimes. It just makes us think about things that we don't often think about. And I want to show you how really you can change your family's world. You can, you can really just have a new level of peace and, and comfort and um, security by the, end of what, by the end of this web class, okay? So my goal here for today is to really help two types of people. Um, if you're a married couple, for sure. If you're married, then you're going to get the benefit of all this information we'll share with this web class. Um, I'm also going to be sharing a lot of information about how this impacts people who are unmarried. Uh, we help a lot of clients who are life partners and they never got legally officially married. And so there'll be some nuances in here that I'll share with you about how that affects you. Now, the, the teaching topics for today are really two things. I want to teach you how to make sure your spouse doesn't end up in probate wasting tens of thousands of dollars and years of their life. Um, 
and I'm just going to share with you as much as I possibly can. And then the second thing is what I've really uh, discovered is that the best way to do that, really the only way to do that, is to have some automated trust uh, uh, in place so that it happens without you having to worry about it. Because more and more I see, um, you know, as dedicated and as smart and as disciplined as we are, um, we we do better when we have somebody coaching us at the gym. You're the one who has to get up and go do it, but you you just do such a better job when you've got somebody coaching you, and so that's what our automated trust program does. Now, what I can't do is give you specific legal advice. Uh, so today, you know, we've got to start off with this really terrible legal disclaimer from the state bar. This is not legal advice for your situation. This is not um, advice that you should just uh, go draft and do something all on your own. Please don't. Um, this is general information of an educational nature. Uh, so use it. This, this is to help you make better decisions. So please stick around and get all of this information. It's hard to know what, um, what information is reliable out there. And I'm telling you that this, what, what I'm going to share with you guys today is based on 13 years of experience and um, having helped uh, thousands of, of families go through this. Okay, getting rid of that little hard candy because now my throat feels better. Okay, so, you know, if you don't know who I am, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Good job, right? You're, gonna, you're dedicating this time for your family to help learn how to make better decisions. Our hundreds and hundreds of clients um, around Arizona, they've done it and they, you know, what they found after getting this stuff done and organized is that you just have this kind of new found appreciation for life because, you know, and especially going through the stuff we're going through right now, we should appreciate it. Um, I've had, uh, I've been an estate planning and asset protection attorney uh, since 2007, our firm has protected uh, over $800 million of our clients' money, of their life for their families. Um, and we have two books on the subject. So if you, if you want to learn more about this, if you want to study some of this, you, you're welcome to get a copy. The, they're both available on Amazon, Pack Your Parachute, and then Arizona's Probate Guidebook for Consumers. And, you know, feel free to read and study and learn about this stuff. The, the more education you get about it, the better decisions you're going to make for your, for your husband, for your wife, and for your kids, right? Um, because this is, what, this is what the best case scenario is. Our first case study, this was a married couple. Uh, they had their life savings built up. They had some home equity. They put together their documents, their legal documents, a will, a trust, power of attorney, health care directives. They kept it up to date, right? Automatic updates. That's the key here, uh, because life gets in the way. We don't, we don't, we don't remember to, you know, renew our car insurance unless they tell us to renew our car insurance. Well, same thing with your trust, right? Same thing with your estate plan. Uh, they, uh, they both ended up passing away a few years later. And this is one of those circumstances where we can look at that, look at their family, look at what the situation was, and we could easily say the fees for probate would have been sixty-seven to one hundred and six thousand dollars here in Arizona, and it would have at least been two years in court um, to settle their estate for, from one spouse to the next, and then from the next spouse to the kids. But in reality, they spent zero dollars in probate fees that was awesome and zero time in court their their affairs their their finances their wishes everything was kept private nothing was put on the public record um, and their kids got to just march forward and grieve without having to uh, you know, fight with each other or or even maybe not even fight but even not even feel suspicious about each other about are you doing Everything you're supposed to be doing, it just went like they wanted it to. It was super, super simple. So what I want you guys to walk away with are three big topics. These are the three big takeaways that I think 
every married couple needs to know. Um, and share this information. You, you know married couples, you know people who are going to get married, you know, um, please share this information. So number one, does your spouse have emergency medical documents? Emergency medical documents. We're going to talk a lot about that. Number two, have you both done a review in the last year? Okay, why is that important? We're going to talk about that. Number three, do you have a verified asset report for both spouses? Do you have a verified asset report? We're going to show you what that looks like. I'm going to show you, share with you what it includes, what needs to be in there, um, and a couple examples of what happens when you don't have that. So let's dig right in. Um, before, so actually before we get into this first topic, I want to set the stage for you. Uh, we do lots of education. We've moved a lot of it to online. I, I actually was able to record, I am able to record today's web class. So this web class, what this, the point of today's education is, it's, it's, it's past the point of for people who've decided they need a trust, who've decided that uh, okay, I've learned what a will is, I've learned what a trust is, I know my family situation, and we need a trust. We need a revocable living trust. So this, this is the next step, okay? Well, now that you've decided you need a revocable living trust, what's next? And so I'm not going to spend any time today talking about why you may or may not need one. We're past that. You can look at some of our other web classes about why you may or may not need one so you can make that decision. Um, just want a real quick hit that a trust is a private document. It owns your stuff. It's controlled by you. It's easy to change. It's very hard to challenge. You, you are in complete control. So if you've gotten to the point where you say, I need one. This is the right thing for my family. I need to learn a little bit more about it so I can, I know how to set one up. That, that's what today is. It's for you. Okay. Now, Question number one, does your spouse have emergency medical documents? Um, what does that mean? Now, medical, emergency medical documents, I am not qualified. I'm not going to talk about the emergency medical documents like your health insurance. I'm not qualified to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about long-term care insurance. I, I know a little bit about that, but I'm not really qualified to talk about that. Um, I'm not going to talk about your medical records from the perspective of if you have, you know, medical history or if you have specific allergies. I'm not qualified to talk about that. Those are all things you need to deal with as well. What we're going to talk about today is medical documents that allow your husband or your wife or you for your husband or wife to make decisions, have information, know what to do so that you don't have to have the court involved. Um, now, so what we're going to talk about in this first question is there's, there's these two time periods that are on the screen here that I want, to, I want to make sure you know about. The first one is probate while we're alive, and the second one is probate after death. Probate after death is not what this is right now. We're talking about probate while you're alive, okay? Here's what happens. Uh, this was a married couple uh, that came to me maybe 10 or 11 years ago, really early in my practice. She, they'd been married for 30 years at the time. And, or no, I'm sorry, there were 40 years. This was, a, this was another example. We have lots of these examples, unfortunately. So this, one, this was the one that was married 40 years. And he, um, they learned he had early stages of dementia, and they had two adult children. Um, you know, kind of just a normal nuclear family. His dementia had declined, uh, and so she was taking more and more full-time care of him at home. Well, he had a, a medical event where he had to go to the hospital. Um, it was, I believe, a heart issue. And so he was admitted to the hospital and they ran a bunch of tests and some procedures. Came time for him to be discharged from the hospital. Well, if you know how that works, the hospital has to basically certify that they are discharging you to an, to a, uh, an appropriate setting. 
right? Somewhere that can take care of you, meet your medical needs and all that stuff. Well, for him, the wife basically said, yeah, he needs more care than I can provide safely at home. So they had to find a care home and place him into the care home. Well, when he got into that care home and the wife went to the home home, the daughter thought, one of the daughters thought, oh my gosh, this, uh, you know, this is so bad. There's no way my mom really is going to be able to take care of this. She ran off and filed one of these court cases. She filed, she, well, she, what she went to do, she didn't know that she needed to do this, but she went and talked to a lawyer um, because the care home told, told the family, you know, nobody has authority to make decisions for him. And the doctor had told the wife, you guys don't have any legal documents to make decisions for him. Somebody needs to get some legal documents in place. Well, he already had dementia. He was already past the point of being able to make legal decisions. Well, once that happens, he can't, he can't give anybody legal authority because he doesn't have authority to make legal decisions. So the wife went home and the daughter went to talk to a lawyer. Well, I guess that lawyer told the daughter kind of what happens at this point is the court has to give you that authority. So she ran off and filed a guardianship case. That's what a living probate is called while you're alive. And she ran off and filed this guardianship. Well, the wife called the daughter and said, what the heck are you doing? She said, mom, you can't take care of dad. I'm going to take care of dad. And the wife, they've been married 40 years. She's like, are you crazy? And she doesn't have the energy and the stamina and the, and even the, just the, understanding, you know, to, to deal with all the complicated issues that that's going to bring. She, you know, the daughter ran off to court and filed a guardianship. What that does, that triggers the, that another attorney is going to get appointed. Uh, and in their case, triggered that a guardian ad litem was going to be appointed. All of this gigantic court procedure, this big bureaucracy that basically looks like your child is now in CPS and you're, you're essentially fighting the court system to gain control of your spouse as if they were your child. And so the wife, she had to hire us for us to go in and fight for her to be able to take care of her husband. Um, this family is looking at $40,000 in fees just over the first six months. And unfortunately, this is also involving their finances, which we'll talk about here in a couple minutes. Um, but just to get the wife the ability to make decisions for her husband, to be able to talk to the doctors, to be able to go to the hospital with him. And once this six months is done, what is going to be required is a whole bunch of annual reporting to the court. And it's going to literally cost this family over $10,000 a year in fees. Uh, it just it just is ridiculously expensive, and you've got all these strangers from the court appointed to be able to make that that they're now they're now questioning everything you do, every decision you make for your husband or for your wife, and and they get to second guess it, and the judge gets to second guess it. There's an investigator, and none of this happens in privacy. This is all on the court's public record, and that's what this family is currently getting dragged through. Um, and the way this happens, I mean, there are, there are hundreds and probably even thousands of these cases that are happening just here in Maricopa County. Uh, and the way that this happened, it just, I mean, it's not even a, a thing that happens intentionally. They were just living their life. They were retired, enjoying their retirement, living in their home that they'd been in for, I think about 30 years, I think is what she told me. And you know, they get to occasionally visit their grandkids. And then all of a sudden, you know, boom, this emergency takes them to the hospital and the hospital policies kick in and say, I'm sorry, ma'am, you don't have authority to make decisions for your husband unless you've got some legal documents in place. And this tiny little emergency triggers this whole thing. Now they're going to be in court for the rest of his life. And 
It's just a nightmare. It's not at all what they would have wanted. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being told by the hospital and then by the court that you couldn't take care of your spouse? What would that, how would that feel? I mean, I'm, I'm talked to this gal so many times on the phone and she's just crying over this. Um, it, it's true heartbreak. Uh, so, so here's what you've got to do for spouses. You have to have these in place. You cannot pretend like it's automatic that you have this, this permission. You don't. Arizona law does not make it automatic. You've got to have five basic medical documents in place. Here's what they are. Write these down. You've got to have a health care power of attorney. Number two, you've got to have a, me a mental health power of attorney. Number three, you've got to have a HIPAA authorization. Number four, you need a living will. And number five, you need a emergency legal agent. Those three documents are absolutely necessary for married couples. You've got to have them, whether you've been married for 40 years or you've been married for one year. And hey, guess what? If you're a life, if you're life partners and you're not married, you have to have this stuff in place. There's no recognition whatsoever under Arizona law that life partners have any authority whatsoever. You're going to get locked out. You've got to have these five documents in place. And as far as I know, four of those you can get anywhere. The fifth one, emergency legal agent, as far as I know, we're the only firm that produces that, and we've created a system for you to be able to do that online. And, well, let me tell you, it's almost ready. For you to be able to do that online, very quick, easy, happens automatically, you just get stuff done right through email. Um, so you've got to have those five legal documents in place for medical needs, for, for a medical emergency. All right, number two. Have you done a review in the last year? Okay, have you done a review in the last year? Uh, we get this question all the time. I did my will or my trust or my documents, you know, sometime in the past. How old is too old? How often do I need to have these reviewed by someone? Well, uh, I don't know. Honestly, I've been doing this for over a decade with thousands of families, and I still don't have a black and white answer to give you. I'm sorry. I wish there was. What what really I think is a is a is totally misleading is to tell you it has to be every five years or every three years. I, I just I've seen no proof that that's actually correct in all circumstances. What I'm going to share with you is, is the system we use to keep it up to date so that you can do the same thing. Because the reality is, uh, it, it, Arizona doesn't tell us how old is too old. That, you need to know that. There's no law in Arizona that says, you know, five years is too old, or 10 years is too old, or, or 18 months is too old, or one month is too old. There's no laws whatsoever. So you just need to, I'm going to give you guys my experience, and you use it however you want. Um, we had, because this living probate, this is the bigger issue, not the probate that happens after death, though, although that is an issue, which I'll, I'll tell you that too, I'll tell you why, but the living probate while we're alive, that's the bigger issue. The reason that's the bigger issue is, is illustrated, we had a gal come to us, her husband was exposed to Agent Orange in, v in the Vietnam War. And, you know, decades later, he comes to uh, find out, after a, a, a very successful career, comes to find out that he, um, that, that his dementia is really starting to set in. And he's starting to notice some memory issues. And they're going through that really tough, you know, phase of life where he has to decide, I'm pretty young, I'm in my mid-50s, but I'm probably going to have to retire just because of my health. And so they start to make some plans and some provisions, and they, they one of the things they do is they get their legal documents created, their will, their trust, their power of attorneys, their medical directives. They get it all put together. They had a friend who was a lawyer and did him a favor and got it all done. And 
couple more years went by and his health just got to be, his, really with his memory, got to the point where he just wasn't able to maintain the job anymore. So he retired and they just, you know, they retired, started really, you know, spending their time with the family, their two kids and their grandkids. And um, a few years, two years more went by. Um, and at a certain at one of their doctor's appointments, the doctor kind of just turned to the wife and said, you know, you, you know this. Uh, you can see it here. You can see it with him. I'm sure you've seen it at home, but he really can't be making any more legal decisions. He, he needs to have somebody take over all of his affairs, his medical decisions, uh, this, everything that happens at home, all the financial affairs. You've got to take over management of everything. And I mean, I, I know them, I've known them for so long and I just, I, I, the devastation that I can't imagine she must have felt hearing that that's where her husband was. I just can't imagine that. Um, but, you know, she went and pulled out these old dusty documents, went to banks, went to the insurance companies, went to their financial advisor and started to gather and organize everything so that her name was the only name on the account as for herself and as the power of attorney for him so that because what happens when you when when some or what can happen what's a a concern that i've seen happen when somebody has dementia or alzheimer's or some other cognitive you know you know brain disease is there's a risk right that if they answer the phone and somebody gives them a sob story of this charity that's in the in the Caribbean or in Africa or in the you know in Asia or something. You know, we really need your help. There's people dying. Can you please just donate you know fifty dollars a month or something? Is they'll string them into it. We've seen this uh, so many times, and um, they'll they'll start giving out credit card numbers and debit card numbers and checking account numbers. Um, so one of the things that has to be done is you have to actually take their names off of the majority of the accounts just to protect your own financial affairs, right? And she had to do that. Um, and you know, there's there's tips and there's guidance, and there's good ways to do that so it doesn't completely alienate and, and frustrate the spouse who's going through that. But what she found was that one of their major investments where most of their nest egg was, actually they came back and said, I'm sorry, we can't help you because these documents, number one, your trust wasn't implemented correctly, but number two, on all of these retirement accounts, you're not on there and the power of attorney you're giving us for him is too old. We, we can't. We can't rely on this thing. It's way too old. It's too risky for us to rely on a document that's seven years old. And so you were, number one, we're freezing this account. And number two, you have to go get a court order if you want to get access to this. And they completely froze and cut off all their finances from her. She couldn't pay the bills. She couldn't take distributions out of that. She literally had to go get a court order. That's what this living probate thing does. That's what the requirement is. Um, so that's when you know she got referred to us and we helped her do that. That living probate to get access to it, that first you know the first effort is like twenty thousand dollars. She spent over twenty thousand dollars. The court had to she had to hire us. The court had to appoint an attorney. The court appointed an, a guardian ad litem. There was a court investigator, there was a physician involved, a court appointed physician, and then the court also asked for the appointment of a tax attorney and an attorney to help with the evaluation of long-term care benefits through Medicaid and, and the VA. This was like seven or eight professionals who were now appointed overnight, instantly, to dig into their family's affairs who are all being paid out of their money, and the court requires that. That's what the rules require. This was $20,000 in the first month, and it was about, over the first nine months, it was about $70,000 just to be able to get her that court.
court order and permission to be able to take care of her husband. Just ridiculous. And then now she has to, same story with every single one of these probates that happens while you're alive. That is a, you're now required every year, once a year, to report and file a detailed reporting of all the activity that has happened with your money, with the doctors, how, how, how your spouse is doing. Just, I mean, it's a lot of, uh, of invasion into your life. Um, and so I, I, I just, I want you to know it, it was not automatic for her. She had to go get a court order. Even though they had documents in place, they were too old. How old is too old? Well, what I recommend now after doing this hundreds of times is once a year. So far, we've been taking care of our clients once a year and that has protected them. This, this couple, um, they were a blended family. This was their second marriage. They both had children from a prior marriage. They had some money tucked away in savings. They had their home equity and they joined what we call our trust care program and that's what we use where we chase, you know, we will, we will chase that down once a year. What is going on? And they, as part of it, they put together their will, their trust, power of attorneys, the medical documents, all of the documents that are necessary. And um, their last update was only nine months before the emergency happened. This was a complete freak accident. They both died this, within one day of each other. Um, him that night, her the next day. A uh, very elderly couple. And their their estate had no probate fees. No, nothing had to go through court. Completely protected. Um, it was kind of unique. They weren't leaving everything equally to all the kids because they'd helped some of them out during their life. And so they gave a little bit more to the other ones out of their estate out of their trust um, and the, the child that they designated was able to just carry everything out. It was really, really amazing. Their kids didn't complain about it. Nobody was rushing off and hiring lawyers. Even though the kids did not have that strong of a relationship beforehand, they saw that this was recent. They saw that it was it, it, it carried out their, that they, they could see this was their wishes. It's not something that happened, you know, a decade ago, and now we're brushing these documents off saying, okay, this is from 15 years ago, this is from five years ago, and life looks totally different, but we still have to honor it kind of a thing. Um, so our recommendation is once a year, and here's what I recommend you go through once a year, okay? Um, you have to look at three dimensions of your life. So if you're writing this down, this is what I would write down. This is what you need to look at every year. The first dimension is your people. The second dimension is your assets. And the third dimension are the laws, the laws. So first, your people. So you're going to look at whether you like them or not, you have to look at all of the people in your life that are your biologically related family members or adopted, okay? your parents, grandparents, your siblings, and then your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. So go up and down your sort of ladder, your ancestry. And then you have to ask, okay, well actually those are all the people that are involved. And then you also need to look at anybody who's connected to your estate plan. And it can be connected either through marriage, so it might be your um, if you have a step parent or if your sibling has a spouse, if, you're, if your sisters or brothers are married, and then you look at your kids' spouses, so your daughters and sons-in-law, okay? And then if your grandkids, if they're of the age for marriage as well. Um, so you're going to look at all of your, like I said, your people. That's your first dimension. Are any of these people, so list them all out and then ask the question, have any of them gotten married? Have any of them gotten divorced? Have any of them um, acquired a lot of money or gotten into financial trouble? Either just, you know, they're just in financial trouble or they've actually gotten, like, filed bankruptcy or they have some creditors chasing them around. 
um, or are or and then next are any of them in any kind of legal trouble? Have they been sued by anybody in any kind of circumstance? Even a divorce, right, is a lawsuit. Or if they're in a business and they're involved in a lawsuit, or if they're suing somebody, because in lawsuits when you sue someone, they tend to sue you right back. Um, then ask, have any of them had any children, any new births, or anybody pass away? Has anybody died? Then ask, have any of them had any major medical issues or become disabled? Um, those are the issues you need to ask in that whole list of people. And if the answer is yes to any of those issues, with regard to any of those people, okay, then you probably you may need to update your plan. That's just the that's just the flat out truth. Now, do you need to? I can't say yes because it depends on everybody's circumstances and exactly what happened. But for us, that's the trigger of let's have a conversation, okay? So that's your people dimension. The second dimension is your assets. Okay, your assets, and included in that is everything, and I mean everything. Your house, your checking, your savings, your IRAs, your 401ks, your annuities, your life insurance, any stocks you have, any mutual funds you have, if you have any stock options, if you have any... Um, um, deferred compensation plans at work, pension plans, your social security, your income, if you have a business, the business income, the business assets, the business itself, your vehicles, your personal property around the house, the stuff you see behind me, if you own firearms, if you have a safe deposit box, if you have any gold or silver or precious metals, um, your tools, your stuff in your garage, uh, your antiques, your collectibles, your artwork. What else? Anybody owe you any money? Kids or not kids? If you own any other real estate, investment property, if you own a second home, any timeshares, if you have any CDs or, um, I said mutual funds already, Okay, do you get it? That's a long, 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 long list, but all of those things, oh, mineral rights, sometimes that gets forgotten. All of those things, okay, now list all of those out and then ask, have any of these gone up or down in value? We generally like to ask by more than 10% up or 10% down, okay? Then, have you disposed of any from last year? Meaning, have you closed any accounts, sold any real estate, sold any stocks, sold any um, vehicles, sold, you know, sold or gotten rid of any of them, or have you acquired any new ones, new bank accounts, new investment accounts, new life insurance, new vehicle, new real estate, new whatever, okay? Have you sold or disposed of any of those? And then we also ask, do you have any plans to do that in the coming year? plans to dispose of or acquire any of these things on the asset list, okay? Oh, one other thing that I forgot to put on there, inheritances. If you've inherited or you anticipate inheriting, okay? That's your asset dimension. And then the legal dimension, okay? On the legal dimension, there are six elements you need to consider, okay? Federal and state, at the federal level, okay, you have... Um, statutes, case law, and regulations, and then you, at the state level, you have the same thing, statutes, case law, and regulations. You have to look at the probate, the trust, and the tax sections for each of those. Now, we monitor those, we subscribe to services that we pay a lot of money for to make sure we get all the latest and greatest updates on that stuff, and we push those out automatically to our clients on our trust care program. But if you're doing this, you're smart enough to do this on your own. Those are the elements you want to you want to look for and monitor. Okay, you can even set up Google Alerts. You can do whatever you can to monitor and look. Whenever those laws change, 
and we see a, about one major change every two years or so and then minor changes happen all the time. They literally happen like every other month, I think, because case laws are, are you know, the decisions, the opinions are coming down often and um, new rules and regulations come down pretty frequently. Uh, right now, this year, we had a big change for IRAs and we had a big change on how we draft wills and trusts and power of attorneys in Arizona because the probate rules have changed. So because we want to avoid probate, we've changed how we're drafting some things. So, um, so those are some, some of the big changes that have happened. But those, all those things, you need to sit down and ask yourself, are, do any of those things, uh, have any of those things changed? If yes, then you need to dig in and see where do I need to update my plan? Because the reality is, if you don't keep it up to date, then hello, probate, and, you know, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 to get it started, and then $10,000 a year for the living probate, okay? So you want to avoid that. You don't want your family being dragged through that. All right. So that's how um, we do, we recommend you do the updates on an annual basis. All right. Let me take a breath. Let me grab a drink um, for this next one. Do you have a verified asset report for both spouses? This is so, this is so critical. I'm, I, I get, I get really um, passionate about a lot of things in what we do because I just see how much it destroys families and cost people tons of money. The lawyers in probate, they just, they absolutely love it. They just keep grinding away, you know, at the probates and, um, and it just doesn't have to be like that. I, I pulled up a sample spreadsheet. This is not from one of our clients. This is basically an example of how organized it needs to be. You've got to have an organized inventory. Remember what I just talked about a minute ago on your asset, that second thing? You know, it's got to include all those things that I just, I rambled off a huge long list. You've got to have a list of your assets, whether they're in the trust or not in the trust, whether it is yours, you know, his, hers, or ours. I don't care. You've got to have a list of everything. And and it's not hard to put together, it just takes time to do and organize it. So what I recommend you do is, if you're comfortable in spreadsheets, do it in a spreadsheet. If you like paper, do it on paper, I don't care. It needs to have a couple columns and then you can list everything down and fill in the columns. Here's what I think the columns should have. First column is just a description of what it is you know, checking account at Bank of America, or more than anything, I would say checking account, because the next column is where is it held? You know, what's the institution or the company's name? So important. We have so many clients that say, my dad had life insurance, but we don't know where. Like, oh, you know, they ask, isn't there a place where it's all recorded somewhere? We can just go look it up. I'm like, no. You know, are your bank accounts recorded in some central government database? Well, maybe they are. They probably are, but no, not in any database they're going to let me have access to, right? Or you, or your family after you die, for sure. So, no, that doesn't exist. You need to say, I have life insurance, and it's, I, I, it's at MetLife, or it's at Voya, or it's at whatever, right? So, description of what it is, first column. What institution or what company, second column. Third column, if you're so inclined to put the account number or the policy number or the parcel number or the street address or the state where it exists or something to tell us that is a unique identifier for that thing. Um, if that's all you do, that makes it so much easier. Okay, if you want to add another column of the value, which sometimes is a total guess and that's fine, but the estimated value of that, then great. Go ahead and add the estimated value that can be helpful. Um, if you also 
would include your income if you have different sources of regular income like Social Security or a pension or even dividends you get off of your brokerage accounts or your stock holdings you can list it, have another section on that page that says income and it can just list Social Security you get this much a month dividends you get this much a quarter and where those come from that can be very very helpful um, and that's all it needs to be because if you don't you end up your wife or your husband will end up like we've we've had this happen uh, so far uh, half a dozen times where a um, it, I think it's happened more with the surviving spouse who is a wife, but we've had it happen with a husband. I know, you know, it might feel more traditionally that the husband takes care of the finances, but that's not always been the case. We've had clients where the husband was really clueless about their finances and let the wife take care of it all because that's just how they have always done it. That was her skill set and, you know, fine. But when she passes away, this is what ends up happening. We had this married couple. They've literally been married over 50 years. Um, but by the time he passed away, they had, they had surpassed 60 years together. They had three adult children. When he passed away, she didn't know what their life savings were. She didn't know their home had equity. She didn't know if they had a mortgage or not. And he passed away, um, and she had to go through probate for because they had um, two things at the bank that she knew about that were just in his name and there was no beneficiary uh, there was nothing and so the bank told her sorry you got to go through probate to get these accounts even though we know you guys were married and you guys were customers of ours for you know 100 years and you have a bunch of you know other accounts that were joint these ones were not so um, she had to go through probate after his death, and that took about two years. It cost her oh, about thirty thousand dollars in fees. Uh, and what it was surprising, one of their children, who uh, who you know wasn't maybe the closest, but didn't anticipate them to be a, a problem causer, actually went off and hired a lawyer and started sending threatening letters. Um, you know, everything ended up being settled fine, but still, that was a real shocker and really frustrating for her. Um, five years later, literally five years later, and, and in the middle of that five years, her health declined to the point that one of her other children, her daughter, had to start taking over and managing all of the finances for her. Um, we finally think we've been able to account for everything. There were stocks that the dad, that her husband had purchased in, in all kinds of companies from all over the country decades ago. And it, it, was, it was just staggering how much, how much money there was that she had no idea about. And it just, it, it became a complete, gigantic, year-long process. Because some of these things only send a statement once a year, and some of them never send statements, like original bonds that he held in certificate form. Um, so the daughter helped get everything organized. She had to quit her job, basically, to take care of mom full-time and take care of the finances and help gather and organize all these records. It's really been a long process and it has just wasted so much money. The amount of uh, cost that they've incurred to hire accountants and to pay our firm to help organize the records just to be able to um, know where things are, it has been a drain on the family. And so I, I just You've got to maintain this verified asset list. Um, now, the big thing that I think you need to add onto that list, the last column, or maybe the last two columns, is number one, who is the registered owner of that and who's the registered beneficiary of that thing you should know who both of those are. 
because that's going to control who gets it in during life if there's a if somebody's incapacitated or after death. Okay, that is everything that I had to deliver you guys content wise and to share with you to hopefully help you make better decisions for you, for your spouse, for your husband, your wife, um, or if you're not married, to know that you've got to dig in and deal with this stuff for your partner. It has to be done. Um, so let me just ask you guys some questions. Uh, if you're not a client of Keystone, if we did not help you create your estate plan, then I want you to hang out for a couple minutes because I want to explain to you, here's exactly what our services look like so that you can look at this and say, huh, okay, I'm at the point where I need a trust. I'm at the point where I know I need to do something. Here's what it looks like to do it at Keystone. And that way you can make that decision about who you're going to use to help you take care of your wife and your spouse and your family before you leave today. Um, if you already are a client of Keystone, if we already did your trust, if you if you continue to maintain your trust care membership, you're covered. You just need to get your annual appointment scheduled if you haven't done it already, and and dig in, and we'll help you go through the update. Um, if you if you didn't maintain your trust care membership, totally fine. We recommend my recommendation is that you come in and you get that restarted. There's a different fee structure for you, but it's worth getting started because you don't want this investment of your whole estate plan to just be getting more and more and more out of date as life goes on because if you get past that year mark and our, our guarantee is gone and our trust care program maintaining you currently is how we guarantee your plan will work. So, so if you're not a client, uh, we haven't done your trust at Keystone. Stick around. Let me explain to you um, how it works here. Because um, if if I can show you what I'm going to show you, what, if I can show you how to create your five medical documents for an emergency, if I can show you, you know, how to, um, uh, oh my gosh, my mind just went blank. If I can show you how to create your first version simply and easily so it's not a big deal not a big pain in the butt and how to update and keep it maintained for the rest of your life easily I hope would you say that would be a good easy way for you to protect your family I hope you would say yes um, because that's what I want to do even though I know it feels like we drink it from a fire hose I pack it as much as I can but it's all that I can get in in my limited time here so this is what we do. We make sure you get your emergency medical documents put together. We make sure you get a, an automated review process set up. We make sure your asset list is recorded and kept up to date. Now, if you're already a client, you're already in this. You're already part of our program, like I said. And otherwise, if you're not, who should be a trust care member? Well, first, we have a strict no curmudgeons policy, period. We just, I'm sorry, we, we love our clients. We enjoy working with our clients. I work with, you know, our team. We are such fun, happy, enjoyable people to be around in the office that we want our clients to be the same way. And if that's not you, totally fine. If you, you know, you don't have a half glass full outlook on life, hey, totally give you permission to live that way. Um, you're not going to enjoy working with us because we are, and we're just going to like rub on you like sandpaper. So, um, so, but if you are half glass full kind of person and, and you're not having optimistic outlook on life and you're interested and you see the value of having a, a team of advisors, you know, people who help you make the best decisions for your family, that's who we're looking to work with. Um, and then just the objective data points, you know, uh, owning real estate of any value or uh, or multiple properties, lots of value. You know, we work with lots of real estate investors who own, you know, 40, 50. I, we even have one over 100, um, 100 homes. Um, and then as far as financial assets, typical client for us 
is going to be about five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars in financial assets. But we we have a big range, you know, all the way down to about a hundred thousand dollars of life savings, up to you know five, six, seven million dollars is pretty typical for us. Um, how our process starts? Almost all of our clients come through some type of educational uh, event like today, this web class where you learn in a group setting and um, just hear some teaching, learn some information, and either decide, all right, I want to talk privately and meet with someone, and that's the next step, or you've learned the information and you realize, wow, I just don't like Keystone. I just don't like Francisco, and you know what? I'm okay. That's fine. I'm not insulted, but this gives you a chance to learn that, and if this is something you realize you need to deal with, and you see, hmm, I might like working with Keystone, then our first private appointment is what we call a discovery hour, which I'll explain and give you some more details about. And it's after that appointment where we really dig in and start to build a plan for you. So the next appointment is a private one-on-one for you to be able to meet with someone on my team to decide, do I want to do business with Keystone? And that's where you ask a ton of questions, you get them all answered, we explain to you our process and what your options are and our whole pricing structure so nothing is a guess. You're not wondering, are they going to bill me by the minute and am I just writing them a blank check? That's never the case with my firm. And so you get to just do that one-on-one -on -one because I know question, you will have questions about how does this, you know, I, here's my situation, how is this going to work for me? Um, something you always want to look for at the very top of the screen there is a guarantee around these documents. Your life is going to be wrapped up in this whole plan. Your family is going to depend on this. Your wife, your husband is going to depend on this when you're not around. And if it doesn't work when you're not around, what are they going to do? When we started our trust care program, we built into it a no probate guarantee. Look for that when you're going out to get this done, when you're doing this for your family. You, you wouldn't buy car insurance unless you knew they were going to be there to protect you in an emergency. That's what you need to look for a written guarantee around your will, your trust, okay? Now, our no probate guarantee only is um, only works with our trust plan and above, but we offer a will plan. Our packages range anywhere all the way from the most complicated, expensive, everything, all the bells and whistles, super crazy asset protection, blah, 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 fill in, you know, everything you can think of, about $25,000 all the way down to about $1,600. And the nice thing about our firm is we do package everything as a flat fee. So there's no guessing or wondering if I want that, how much is it going to cost? You'll just know. It's just like picking from a menu, okay? You go to the restaurant, you order off. Well, we don't go to restaurants right now. But when we used to and when we're going to in the future, hopefully soon, uh, you just pick off the menu, you know what the prices are. Same thing with our firm, okay? Um, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of it. Most of our clients, they start with something very simple, very introductory, and then over time, over the years, they add to it. You know, get the foundation done. Understand what you're doing. Make sense of that. It's great to get that foundation done while you understand it. Don't bite off more than you can chew, okay? And then get it started. The next appointment is what we call a discovery hour, your first private appointment with someone in my office. It's you and it's uh, one of our client relationship managers. You will do three things. You will spend the whole time just 100% talking about your family's issues, what your goals are, and all the options that might be relevant for your family. We're not going to give you make you learn about options and strategies and tax law and things that don't make sense for you. 
You'll sit down and that's all you will do. You're going to walk away being totally clear about here's the options for my family. Uh, you know, we could do A, B, and X and Y. There you go. You don't need to know everything out there that Google has to offer. So you'll walk away with some real clarity around this that that's what we've designed that appointment for so that you walk away with some real clarity. Because right now, I, what I see happen a lot of times is folks will be reading online and going to a webinar and going to a seminar in person and a lawyer teaches it about and it's tax law this and trust strategy and it's so confusing and then you go sit down with the lawyer and the lawyer uh, dumps everything on you that they know about trusts and estates and probate and it's just a a vomit of information that then you end you end the appointment and you kind of go wow I'm more confused than when I began and so we have designed this so that it's not with a lawyer because we figured that lawyers actually even myself were kind of that's not our strength to simplify things um, so we put client relationship managers in there who are trained on all these options who are trained to help simplify and organize this so you walk out of there with real clarity about your family okay so we protect you from from that confusion at the discovery hour there's a ton of value packed into this discovery hour um, you're going to walk out with some very tangible things as well okay we'll give you obviously you get the discovery hour appointment with the staff member in my office you'll get the personal information book organizer this is one of the ways we give you to help you get your life organized, right? One of the things we talked about today was a verified asset report. This is the start of that. Third thing is the myths of retirement investing, okay? That is a, uh, that's amazing. I, oh, I wish I had another hour to, to share some of this with you guys, but let's just say that as broken as my industry is and as messed up as a lot of attorneys are and how they treat their clients. Financial advisors have some some reputations as well and the myths of retirement investing basically will will tell you how you want to make sure you don't get ripped off by financial advisors and how you can make sure you get into just good solid, you know, consistent investments for your whole financial security. That's what that is. Um, successor trustee handbook is a set of instructions that will tell your successor trustee how to do their job in an emergency. I mean, you've got to give them some instructions. They've never done it before. And then a digital copy of my book, Pack Your Parachute. Um, and that's, you'll leave with all those things at our discovery hour. We pack it with value, over $1,400 of value to you. And, um, and it, I mean, really, if all it did was cut through all the noise, and help you learn, here's what the options are for my family that we need to consider. And here I'm now going to get organized with my finances. And oh my gosh, here I've just learned some things about how not to get ripped off by financial advisors. And oh my gosh, now I know how to, or what to tell my successor trustee how to do their job. And oh my gosh, I got this free copy of this book that I'm going to be able to learn 12 more things about estate planning that will affect my family. If all you did was do that appointment and nothing else with us, how much would that be worth to you? All those things. Um, we do those appointments, they're $125. And like, like everything our firm, it's $125. It is applied towards any services that you, that you choose to move forward with. So if you go to the discovery hour, you sit down and you say, great, let's get started. You get that $125 applied to the services. Uh, but that's just a commitment from us to make sure we dedicate that time for you. We give you that hour and our staff, obviously they're paid, so we have to cover that whole appointment process. Um, but that's a flat fee, you know, there's no surprise charges there. And, um, and you walk away with that. But my team, they beat me up a little bit and they've asked me to start um, offering this at a little discount. So we are, we're getting rid of that, um, that price and so it's $75 right now 
for you to have one of these appointments. If you are uh, not a client of Keystone already, this is a good place to start because you get that credited against your fees. And it, you know, for those who choose to move forward, you'll get a nice little deal there. Uh, we do even give a 100% satisfaction guarantee on that appointment, right? So if you walk out of there and you're like, wow, it was a waste of my time, you get your money back. Um, and all you have to do, all we ask is that you schedule that right now. Just jump online. If you've already, based on what I just shared with you, you know if you need to do this or not. This is your way forward, okay? Your family depends on us. They defend, depend on us. My wife depends on me. Your wife, your husband depends on you to take action. And your next step would be to jump on that website right there. And it's got an option right there to schedule a discovery hour. You just find a time that works for you. You pay right online. And that's it. You don't need to prepare really for this appointment. There's nothing you need to, you're not, we're not asking you to gather all your information or anything. We just ask you to bring your spouse, you both are required to attend, and commit to making some good decisions for your family. And um, we look forward to meeting with you. Well, I don't have any other information for you guys today. Um, you're welcome to always call the office, but if you have questions, your appointment is your best next step. All right? Have a great afternoon, everybody. Go out there and stay safe and protect your families.